everybody. So just bear with me this time. So it's a little bit different from previous sessions, uh, like Keith has mentioned. So um, it's not going to have any SBA. So hopefully it's not going to bore you to death. Uh, but any feedback is well appreciated uh, on how these run. All right. So like we mentioned, we're going to be talking about cardiovascular examination. Um, and it is just going to be an OSCE based station based teaching so it's not going to have that much cardiology in it however I mean the cardiovascular examination really is one of your key examinations both when it comes to exams OSCEs, OSLAs, however your medical school calls them uh, but also you know it is one of the ones that you will be doing when you're a doctor if you think about it patients usually get a bit of cardiovascular a bit of rest a bit of abdominal examination all the time so it is worth knowing what you're looking for um, and it is going to be one of those that will come up in the exam sooner or later, either at the beginning of your medical school or later on, perhaps as like a little chunk uh, of the examination rather than the whole lot. Uh, but, you know, really do bear it in mind. It is an important one. So a few things that we're going to be covering. We're going to be going through the motions, all the steps of what you'll be looking for um, and to cover a little bit of material. So you actually know what you're talking about when you're doing a cardiovascular examination. Uh, so all the essential knowledge and then if we've got a little bit of time at the end we'll cover a couple of common cases that might come up if you have a viva style oski um, and i'll be dotting around a few of my top tips to ace your oski so a little overview like i mentioned this is what we're going to be talking about today this is pretty much the usual layout when it comes to all of your examinations so i'm sure you're very familiar with this but always you start with wipe, you then do a general examination with a cardiovascular focus. Remember, with a cardiovascular focus, um, you're gonna be time limited. I mean, I don't know how your medical schools time these. I think we had about six minutes for hours, maybe even less by the end of finals, I can't remember now. Um, but you, know, you need to be smashing this really quickly. So pick the important things when it comes to the general examination, pick what's relevant, and we'll be moving on to the chest, um, the usual inspection, palpation, auscultation, do a very quick peripheral examination, and then put in your nice concluding remarks that you usually do for exams. Okay, so as you'll see, I've mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about some top tips. I'll start with a few now. Um, remember, OSCEs are a bit of a dance and a bit of a, you know, you know, you will have to rehearse these. Uh, in order to come across as slick and by practicing these you also learn to not look like you've rehearsed them right um, but some medical school will want you to um, you know summarize at the end and not talk during an examination fair enough if that's what they've explicitly told you to do my preferred way of doing it and how you know all of my colleagues have always done it is talk during the examination. If you talk to, during the examination, you're not gonna miss things. You're not gonna have to spend time at the end trying to remember everything you found and summarizing to the examiner. And um, you know, I think it does make you look a bit professional if you talk during the examination. Remember to be kind and polite. You know, it does really show. You will want to be systematic and slick. And I'm gonna give you tips throughout this teaching on how to do that. And always know what you're talking about okay so this will come up again but don't mention signs and things you don't understand or don't know what they look like always be ready to be questioned and for things you know people to say to ask you what what is this what do you mean what have you found show me um so you know bear in mind know what you're talking about so to begin with the ever popular wipe uh, which stands for you always always wash your hands remember you can fill oskies but not washing your hands <laughs> so make sure you do it you introduce yourself get the patient's name and then explain what you're going to be doing um, now for cardiovascular examinations the patient will have to be positioned at 45 degrees some medical schools um some medical schools like to play tricks on their students and have the patient lie flat uh, when you walk into the room. Make sure you put them at 45 degrees. I unfortunately know someone who failed an OSCE for not moving a patient to 45 degrees, which is really mean. I mean, that might not happen to you, but bear it in mind. Um, and the 45 degrees in the cardiovascular examination, it's a bit more of a convention. 
it does keep patients comfortable if they have any respiratory distress and it is the position you want to be examining the JVP in. Um, so yeah, 45 degrees. Um, and I would say a couple of tips to stand out because first impressions matter. Okay, so, you know, like I've mentioned, be polite, be kind and be professional. Remember how you're presenting yourself. This is the first time the examiner and the patient have seen you. You need to inspire confidence, you know, be comfortable with what you're wearing, look professional. Ask the patient how they'd like to be addressed. Do they like to be called by surname, by first name? You know, it's worth checking. I think it makes you look, you know, professional and, and polite if you ask. And then tell the patient that you will be talking to, exam to the examiner. If that's what you, you're going to be doing, remember that it's a bit odd to approach someone and start talking at the examiner while you're looking at them. So let them know. I'll be talking to the examiner, but if you have any question at any point, feel free to stop me. Okay, I think it's quite a nice human warning to give to a patient before you start looking at them. All right, so we're moving on to the proper examination now. Like, you know, you, you will have done general examinations plenty of time, and as usual, always start from the end of bed. I think it's quite handy to start doing it as your hands are drying. I don't know if uh, in COVID times now you'll have to wear full PPE when you do this uh, these exams as well. So while your hands are drying because you put gel on, before you pop your gloves and your apron on, you can already start having a look at, look at what's happening around you. All right, so start at the end of the bed and look at the patient. Do they look comfortable? Do they look like they're struggling to breathe? Do they look really puffy? You know, are they obviously edematous or blue? You know, they might be very sinus. Have a look. And then have a look at what's around them. Now, I think when you practice, it is very easy to just go, I can't see this, this and that, because you've practiced it so many times. And when you're doing the OSCE, you go, oh, I can't see an ECG machine. I can't see any medication. Do pay attention and what is around. Sometimes there will be things around the patient. And if you've learned to say that you can't see them, it looks really funny in an exam so just have a little look around is there anything on the table is there really you know is there an NIV machine is there a walking stick and um, all little things to worth pick, picking out on but don't spend ages doing this it's just a quick browse quick look around the room so you know where your surroundings are and can get a few tips on what's going on with the patient so we're moving on to the general examination you know of the patient rather than the surrounding with a cardiac focus. And I say with a cardiac focus because like I mentioned, you're going to be time pressured and there's no point looking for liver signs in a cardiac examination. I think sometimes people get a bit flustered. They remember all the general examination signs and they just start looking sort of scattergun for things uh, to fill in time. So I think it's always worth having two or three signs that you can always fall back on per examination. So for your respiratory examination, your abdominal one and your cardiac one, have two or three that you know for every point are pretty solid. And if you panicked, you've rehearsed them, you know what you're looking, at least you can say a few things. Um, especially your earlier on examinations when it's, it, it's not going to be, maybe it's going to be actors, it's not going to be patients with clinical signs. That works quite well because you can say, I can't see any of these things because it's pretty unlikely they're going to have them. Now, when it comes to looking slick and looking smooth, like I've said, which is really important in these exams, especially because you're time pressured, um, it's really nice to have a sequence of how you're going to approach the patient and how you're going to examine them. And as you practice this, it will just come naturally and kind of flow to you and you won't spend time thinking, oh, I need to look at the eyes, I need to look at the neck and things like that. So for instance, my, my preferred one is you do a bit of a Macarena dance. So you start with the hands, you move with the wrist, you move for blood pressure, and then you go for face and neck. Um, and I think that way you just don't miss things. Some people like to start in a different sequence and people start like to start with the head. That's fine, as long as you're slick and smooth while you do it. All right. But, you know, find your own sequence. So let's crack on. Talking about hands, everyone's favourite general examination part in the cardiovascular exam. Um, like I mentioned, pick two or three 
don't spend ages looking for every possible thing that you could think about in a cardiovascular examination of the hand. Um, there's a few that are going to be more relevant than others. I know lots of people like to look for plumbing and you'll look for, you know, you'll do your shamrock sign. So you put patient's fingers like that and look for a little diamond in between and see whether that's gone. Some people like to do that. However, it is time consuming to ask the patient to do this. So bear that in mind. Some people just look for a capillary refill or look for clubbing. Um, and then things like, you know, edema, although less likely to be in the hands to look for, palmar erythema, which is usually it happens when patients are um, have a hypodynamic circulation and are peripheral vasodilated. It tends to happen, for instance, in patients with CO2 retention and core pulmonale, you know, the mixed respiratory and cardiovascular disease. Um, and then there's the ones that everyone loves to talk about that you will never see in OSCEs, which is fine to say you're looking for them. Uh, but I would say, make sure you know what you're talking about when you mention these, right? Which is Oslo nodes, Janeway lesions and splinter hemorrhages. Um, they reel off nicely. You can look for them quickly. But like I mentioned, bear in mind what it is you're actually looking for. So if anyone asks, you need to be able to say, what they are right so Osla nodes they tend to be on the fingers either the extension or extensor flexor surface on the fingers i know the patient in this picture also has a couple on their palm that's fine but they tend to be painful painful lumps um which are obviously a sign of infective endocarditis but they are an immune mediated process um, and so because they sort of immune complexes form these lumps on the skin that can be quite painful and so what you'll be looking for is like little bumps and if you touch them they might hurt the patient all right so if you see anything press the thing and see oh other nodes no um Janeway lesion on the other hand tend to be on the palm and you usually find them on the thena or the hyperthena eminences and these are painless really um and they often go in hand in hand with splinter hemorrhages because both Jane lesion and splinter hemorrhages are signs of septic emboli, but they are micro hemorrhages. So the septic emboli block capillaries and burst and cause micro hemorrhages. So you'll see them on the nails and on the palms. I've never seen them. You might see them. <laughs> It'd be very exciting if you do. If you want to say use these in the cardiovascular examination, just know what you're talking about. Okay. Things like quinky, which is like pulsatile nail beds in the aortic regurge. Yeah, that's fine. Again, know what we're talking about if you're looking for it. All right. So you've done with the hands. We're moving on to the pulses. So I'll spend a little bit of time talking about pulses because it's worth doing. Um, there's different ways to do it. Some people like to feel for one wrist first, then move to two to feel for radio radio delay. Some people go straight to two. Up to you. There's no right or wrong. But remember, when you're feeling for the radio pulse, you're looking for rate and rhythm. You shouldn't be commenting on the volume of the pulse. In order to comment for volume on, and character, you need to move either to brachial or carotid. Now, there's lots of information you can get from a radio pulse. First of all, you'll be feeling for the pulse and you'll look for the rate and the rhythm. So is it regular? Is it irregular? Is it irregularly irregular? And you know, fill for 15 seconds and then times by four to get an idea of rate. Some people make up numbers <laughs> during OSCEs, I think, because you're like rushing. Um, try and like get a feel for what like a rough 70 pulse feels like, or at least do it in like multiples of four. <laughs> so it looks like you've done it properly. Um, but if someone's really bradycardic, don't say 110 because the examiner is going to know, right? Um, so don't, don't lie. Um, so you feel, feel for rate and rhythm, then check for radio radio delay. Go for both wrists. You can offer radio femoral delay if you're feeling particularly snazzy, but radio radio will do. And I mean, you're not going to find radio radio delay in an OSCE because it's usually a sign of aortic dissection or coarctation of the aorta, sometimes subclavian artery stenosis. Not really things you're going to be seeing in an OSCE, unless maybe it's a peds cardiac examination and you might find coarctation of the aorta, but rarely in adults. Do you do that? And then you feel for the famous collapsing pulse. 
Now, I think there is a marking point for us for shoulder pain when you're checking for collapsing poles, okay? Um, it is a courtesy. Again, it comes with looking kind and polite, and it only takes a couple of seconds. So before you do it, always ask the patient, do you have any pain in your shoulder? And then if they say yes, maybe you can use the other arm. Um, but then what you'll do is you pop your fingers on the wrist like that and grab the hand and then you raise it above the head and you feel for collapsing pulse, which is a bounding pulse, which then kind of looks like it's sliding down. It's also called a water hammer pulse, but the water hammer is this Victorian invention that no one knows about. <laughs> I don't even know what a water hammer looks like, so that's not very helpful to me if you know that's impressive. Uh, but yeah, have a feel and see whether the pulse is, is falling. I have actually felt this in a patient before, so it can happen. Um, it's worth checking. It only takes a couple of seconds. Then you move on to your brachial or the carotid. Now, before you feel the carotid, some people say that you should ask or take for brewery because if someone's got stenosis, then you press on their carotid, blah, 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 you know, problems. Maybe, I don't know. <laughs> but if you go for the brachial, you're already there. You don't have to go to someone's neck uh, and you can have a little feel and comment on volume and character. But just a little word on volume and character and what that means. Some of you might remember this equation. For some of them, it might come as a surprise. <laughs> I hope not. <laughs> so the cardiovascular output is a product of the stroke volume and the heart rate. The reason why I'm sticking this here is because I think this helps you understand what happens in diseases and you know when you're examining someone say with heart failure what you might expect so if someone sorry just before i say that talking about what is volume and what is character they're pretty much the same word basically the character tells you about the volume which is how full you know how full how filled a patient's pulse is and also the form of the pulse wave which i really don't think <laughs> Unless you're a cardiologist, you're going to pick out. Um, but in theory, that's what a character is. Um, so if someone's healthy and wants to maintain cardiac output, then they've got two options, either to increase their stroke volume or to increase their heart rate. So you can either drink lots, basically constrict your peripheries or increase your heart rate. Um, or, you know, if someone's super healthy and has a massive heart, which means they usually have a pretty large stroke volume, then they'll run usually quite bradycardic, right? Think of your athletes. Now, if someone has heart failure or has a hyperdynamic circulation because of a valvular heart disease, then often what you feel is a raised pulse, you know, pulse rate. Someone might be tachycardic, but their pulse will also feel quite full. So if, if you feel both of those things, you know, you should be questioning why does it feel so full if they're so tachycardic? Because that shouldn't really be the case. Um, in a you know, healthy individual. So worth thinking about, all right. A couple of pulses that you might encounter on your examinations. Again, I don't know, maybe a bit academic. <laughs> I don't know how relevant this is in real life, but worth knowing for vivas and your written exams, things like in aortic stenosis, what you feel is a slow rising pulse because there's a narrowing at the aortic valve, you know, the blood gets pushed out slowly into the system. So you get this slow rise, supposedly, and then the arterial pressure is flat. So you get this sort of, this sort of wave of character of the pulse. In aortic regurgitation, we've already talked about the collapsing pulse um, and I've explained what that is. Um, yeah, you know, kind of makes sense. If you have mixed aortic disease, um, but where reflux is a little bit more prominent, then you can get this thing called a bisperian's pulse, which is a pulse with two peaks. So the blood gets actually, you know, actually gets pumped out. It doesn't collapse immediately. But then there is a second pulse um, as the blood comes back into the heart um, and, you know, fills the aorta, something like that. I'm sorry, I haven't explained this very well. <laughs> <laughs> but I hope that's clear. You know, you can get these sort of odd waveforms, um, which I'm likely to feel in the examination. You'll probably find it in the written exam and things like that. Now, you've done your pulse, you've felt for your brachial, you now can offer a blood pressure. 
I mean, I don't think they'll ever ask you to do a blood pressure unless they want you to stop and do a blood pressure and not examine the rest because it takes time. Um, but they might give you a figure. So it is worth bearing in mind what that means, um, especially if at the end you've got to take a history or, um, you know, answer some bio questions. So apart from your box standard hyper and hypotension, which I'm hoping you should know what the normal ranges are, um, other things you might want to keep an eye, an eye out for are a wide pulse pressure. Um, and that's a more than 100 millimeters of mercury difference between your systolic and your diastolic pressure, which is characteristic of aortic regurgitation. And you can get it in auto dissection as well, but it's not going to be the case that comes up in your OSCEs, I should hope. Um, and then a narrow pulse pressure instead is a difference of less than 25 millimeters of mercury between your systolic and your diastolic blood pressure. Again, typical of things like aortic stenosis, you can get it in congestive heart failure and tamponade, which again, you won't get in a musky. Um, and in theory, you should offer blood pressure in both arms because a difference might be relevant for aortic um, dissection or coarctation of the aorta in children. Um, but again, not in an OSCE, <laughs> I should hope. All right, so. You've done the hands, you've done your blood pressure, you're moving on to the eyes. Now the eyes in cardiovascular examination are actually quite useful. Um, you can see lots of things and you will see these in patients. So it is worth looking out for on the wards. Um, for instance, things like corneal arcus, uh, which is something you might look out for, which is this blue ring around the iris, is common in older patients. So go and have a look, snoop at people's eyes and practice seeing what that looks like. If you see that in someone who's younger, then you might worry because it might be a sign of, you know, hyperlipidemia or familiar hypercholesterolemia, um, things like that. Then some people, you know, again, find your sequence, find your two to three points that you like to cover. Some people always like to look for anemia, which is fair. You can look into the conjunctiva by pulling the eyes down and asking the patient to look up. Warn them that that's what you're going to do. And then look, you can have a look at the lids for xanthal asthmata, which are sort of fatty deposits. And, um, uh, you know, the second picture at the bottom shows that quite nicely. Um, again, a sign of hyperlipidemia. And then have a look in the mouth. It is worth just getting to roll the tongue up, look for central cyanosis, look around the lips. You know, that's quite a nice one that you can reel off. All right. So again, don't spend too much time, but pick up a couple of things. Now, we're moving on to the neck. And I think for the cardiovascular OSCE, this really is a point, you know, a scoring point to look for the JVP. So worth having a look and know what you're looking for. OK, so what are we looking for? when We talk about the JVP. We're looking for the jugular venous pressure. And the reason why that's relevant is because it is an indirect measure of the pressure in the right heart. So especially the vein that we're actually looking for, which is the internal jugular vein, although the external one is easy to look at, we're looking for the in internal jugular vein. Um, sorry, my cat, sorry, <laughs> internal jugular vein. Um, you know, there's no valve between the right atrium and the internal jugular vein. So any anything that happens in the right atrium happens in the jugular. That's why it's so useful to look at. Now the external jugular isn't as good, even though it's easy to see, because it comes out at a right angle from the subclavian. So there is a potential for, you know, flow to be slowed down and not be as good a marker of overload as the internal jugular. Um, but it is harder to see the internal jugular. And I'll show you a picture in a second, actually. I'll bring it up now. Yes, this is my neck. And what you're looking for is in between the heads of the sternocleidomastoid, the clavicular and the sternal head, that's where you're looking for the IJV. So in lots of people, it's quite easy to see the external jugular, but really what you're looking for is a little bit here for the internal jugular. And that's probably the bit you're going to see in, in most healthy people who are not overloaded. You only see a little bit there because then the internal jugular goes below the muscle and then you see it again as it comes up towards the ear. Now, fun story, sometimes you might see, you know, think this patient looks really overloaded, but I can't see the jugular vein. And actually, it can go all the way up here and have a look at the earlobe, whether that's pulsating, because I have seen that too. Some of the, you know, the jugular, internal jugular was so full that you just couldn't see the end of it. And um, so have a look at that. Now, for exam purposes, your patient is at 45 degrees and you will be putting your hand on the sternal angle 
usually four fingers, because what you're looking for is a measure of four centimeters to see whether the jugular vein is you know, raised above four centimeters, uh, which is the marker use overload. Again, it's just to look slick, put your hand so it looks like the examiner knows what you're looking for. And then I think you really want to be doing is check for the pattern jugular reflex. Again, warn the patient, you will be pressing on their stomach. It will, you know, it might be uncomfortable. Let them let you know, you know, if, if they're in any pain and have a good press over the liver. At the same time, you can also feel for a pulsatile liver to check for tricuspid regurge. I've never seen it, but apparently that's a thing. So have a press on the liver and check whether you can see the jugular. Now, in more, most healthy people, you will see a little bit of the jugular come up when you press on the liver, but it should disappear in one to two cardiac cycles. And if it doesn't, then that's also a marker of overload, just someone's not quite so full, okay? Now, the reason why I'm stressing this is because this is actually relevant in your clinical setting. You know, you will be looking at jugular veins in patients who you think might be overloaded with, heart, you know, if they've got heart failure, um, in order to treat them with diuretics. So it's not just important in the cardiovascular OSCE, it is important for life in general. Now this, on the other hand, is one of those things that maybe comes up in Britons. I think if someone has this as a viva for your cardiovascular OSCE, they're really mean. <laughs> but um, supposedly you can see these waves in the jugular venous pressure. Um, I forget them every week. And I have to look this up again whenever I feel like it's relevant. Um, now, I think in this picture, it's quite handy. Uh, if you look at it, if you correlate the jugular waves with what's happening in the cardiac cycle, then it kind of starts making sense, especially if you think that the jugular is a measure of what's happening in the right heart. So I'm not going to go through this extensively, but things like, you know, when the atrial close, <clears throat> that's your A wave. That makes sense. Pressure rises in the atrium, not closes, sorry, contracts, but pressure rises in the atrium, then it also rises in the JVP. Or for instance, when there's systolic contraction of the ventricles and blood is pumped out of the heart you know, into the systemic and pulmonary circulation, then you should expect a drop in pressure. So your JVP should have this X descent. Now, the one thing this is kind of relevant for, you might see patients with tricuspid regurge, a giant C and V wave, they call it a giant V wave, but really what it is, it's the C and the V wave together. And that's because, you know, even though there's there's um, systolic contraction and in theory, blood should leave the atria, because of regurgitation, blood stays in the atria and comes back up. And when the right atrium fills, you get this giant V wave because there's already blood in there. And then it, you know, it combines to the C wave. So you don't see an X descent, you just see A, C, V, and why and things like that. But anyway, that's the, I think that's the only thing it's relevant for. I don't spend too much time thinking about this. All right, so now we're moving on to the chest, which is everyone's favorite part in the cardiovascular examination. So you should offer a chaperone really, if you're gonna strip someone, um, the examiner can be the chaperone, um, especially if it's a woman, it is something to bear in mind, be sensible. And if you don't need to uncover one part of the body, then cover it up after you're done looking. Although it is a bit hard in the cardiovascular examination, but it's something to bear in mind, just again, for courtesy and being polite. So don't spend ages looking at the chest, but things that are worth just having a quick look for are scars, you know, obvious scars, you know, thoracostomy, things like that, like someone actually had a transplant <laughs> and things like that. Do they have a massive pacemaker? You know, pacemakers are quite easy to pick out, especially in thin people, or maybe a loop re recorder. Again, worth thinking about look for. And any chest wall abnormalities, because they might be relevant for things like connective tissue disease and then valve disease, blah, 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 things like that, all right. But have a quick look, don't spend ages looking at it. Um, you can always, you know, while you're examining, you can be like, oh, by the way, they also have a scar. You know, it's not terrible to <laughs> come up with it later. So we're moving on to palpation and auscultation. And I like to think of this as a sequence. But this is the way it was taught to me at one point, which I found really helpful um, to think of it as a continuum. I think it makes it look a bit slicker and it will help you while you're examining the valves, you know, to think of it as a one flow. So when it comes to the cardiovascular examination, there's only a couple of things you're really feeling for. 
Again, before you put your hand on the patient's chest, tell them that's what you're going to be doing. Um, and I would say feel for the apex, you know, you feel for the apex beat first. And I think the best, most universal way of doing it is put your hand on the chest, roughly where you think the apex is going to be. I know some people are being taught to like find a center notch and count two, three, four, five and go all the way down. But I mean, that might not be relevant if someone has dextrocardia. That's not going to be relevant if someone's like apex is all the way like massively deviated and things like that. So the best thing really is put your hand there and have a feel where you feel the pulsation. And then once you've found the apex beat, you can then go back and count where you think it is. So, you know, the normal place for the apex beat is the second intercostal, is the fifth intercostal space, miclavicular line. Fair enough. You know, you can say that. Make sure that it really is there. Or if you can't feel it, that's also fine. In some patients, it's very hard to feel, um, especially if they're big patients or, you know, if they have heart failure or AF, you're unlikely to feel the apex beat. And that's also fine to say. All right. So once you've felt for the apex beat and you know what that is, remember, OK, because that's useful when it comes to auscultation. So you found it. You know where it is. Now you can quickly feel for heaves and thrills. Now, heaves and thrills is one of those things that like confuse me for a really long time. I don't know why, but maybe it doesn't confuse you guys. Um, but heaves are like a, it's a parasternal pulse, you know, pulsation, which is a sign of um, right heart, you know, hypertrophy and strain. Um, so what you're feeling really, you're popping your hand. Sometimes they say, you know, the ulnar side of the hand or things like that. You can literally just put your hand on the sternum and see whether you can feel the right heart sort of pulsating. Um, and then when it comes to thrills, think of thrills just as palpable murmurs. Um, and we're looking quite, quite far down, you know, the divine scale of grading of murmurs if someone has a thrill. But sometimes people do it with the tip of the fingers. They do it with, again, the ulnar side of the hand. What you've been feeling is pop them on the valves. I guess it's useful to do it with the on the side of your hand because you can cover more, more valves in one go. So think about that, you know, how we feel for you. Now, like I mentioned, remember where you found the apex beat because I suggest that's where you start feeling, you know, that's where you start listening for the valves. At the apex beat, you know, pretty much that's where your mitral valve is going to be. Um, so again, this is my suggestion. I was taught this way by a really nice endocrinologist and it just makes sense. It makes you look slick. It makes you look smooth. You don't miss things, um, you know, find your routine. But I think this is quite a nice one. So I'll just tell you what I think, you know, how you might do it. So first of all, you find your apex beat, pop the diaphragm of, the st of your stethoscope over there to listen for the mitral valve. <clears throat> While you're there, that's the best time to do your mitral maneuvers. So ask the patient to roll to the left to listen a bit better for mitral murmurs. You can ask them to breathe out and then turn to the bell, put it there again, breathe out, and then go into the axilla and hear, you know, listen for any um, radiation to the axilla, looking for mitral regurgitation radiation, right? So you've done your mitral, turn back to the diaphragm, listen for tricuspid regurg in the fourth intercostal space, sort of parasternal to the left. Then you move up to your second to listen for pulmonary. Very hard murmurs to hear, also very rare. Don't spend too much time on these guys. And then move on to the aortic, which is second on the right, or sometimes people say just parasternal to the right. <clears throat> and when you get to the aortic, again, a couple of motions that you want to be doing here. Now, first of all, have a listen. Aortic stenosis murmurs are really common. Um, this is where you want to spend a bit more time listening because it's probably a murmur you're going to pick out in an examination if there's going to be a murmur. Then you want to hear, go listen for carotid radiation. I've seen people do this, go from the aortic, go to the neck. Now, that's not great because if someone has a carotid, carotid murmur because they've got carotid stenosis, you're not going to be able to tell whether it's coming from the aorta, the carotid, or maybe both. So really the way you should be doing it, which makes you look like you know what you're doing as well, I think, is move a little bit slowly towards the carotid from the aortic once you've picked out a murmur. Then you get there, ask the patient to hold their breath, have a little listen. You can switch to the bell if you want. Supposedly, listen better with the bell. 
And then at least you know where the murmur was loudest. Was it loudest in the aortic or was it loudest in the carotid? You know, where is it coming from? Because sometimes carotid murmurs do radiate into the chest. So it's worth knowing. All right. Now, you've got into the carotid. Fantastic. You can then move your stethoscope down onto the right sternal edge. And that's where you'll be listening for aortic regurge <clears throat> and get the patient to lean forward at this stage, right? For two reasons. First of all, you know, you hear aortic regurge murmurs better if the patient is leaning forward. You can get them to do the nice maneuver of breathe in, breathe out and hold. Make sure they're not like straining because the Valsalva maneuver can obliterate the murmur of aortic regurge. But if they breathe out, breathe in, breathe out and hold, you can just have a little listen. In expiration, you should hear aortic regurge a bit better. Now, the second reason why it's handy to have the patient in this position is because you can be very slick and tell the patient, while you're sitting up, I'm just gonna have a little listen around the back, okay? And then you move to the base of the lungs to hear for crackles. You save yourself those couple of seconds of getting the patient to sit up, sit down, move around, because you're going around to listen, okay? And again, listening to the bases of the lungs is one of those things that will actually matter when it comes to your clinical days, working in hospitals, uh, because if someone is overloaded, that's the next thing you're going to check after going for the GVP. Yes, you'll listen to their heart, but you really want to know, are the lungs full of fluids? All right, so, you know, patient is like that, fantastic, go have a listen. And that makes you look a bit slick. Now, a couple of practical consideration, a little bit of talking about murmurs. So your systolic murmurs are mitral regurgitation and aortic stenosis. There are a variety of mnemonics to remember these, some ruder than others, pick your own if you struggle. And then mitral uh, stenosis and aortic regurgitation are diastolic murmurs. Diastolic murmurs are more rare and they are harder to hear, although aortic regurg can, can be relatively common. Tricuspid and pulmonary are even rarer and even harder to hear, especially tricuspid sounds a lot like mitral regurgitation. So sometimes and patients can have mixed disease. So sometimes it's a bit hard to know whether it is tricuspid um, but, you know, worth bearing in mind. Now, we've been talking about the diaphragm and the bell of the stethoscope. The diaphragm, which is usually the flat side of your stethoscope, although newer fancy stethoscopes have got different ways. Anyway, um, so the flat side is best for high frequency sounds. That's the majority of your murmurs. MR, AS, AR, they're all high frequency sounds. Um, MS, however, did I say MS? Um, <laughs> and there, so mitral stenosis is the only one you really want to be listening to with a bell in the axilla because it's the lower frequency murmur. All right. So when you found the murmur, this is the kind of things you should be reading, reading out and say, you know, to describe the murmur. So, you, you know, you're examining the patient and you say, I've heard a murmur which is loudest in the um, you know, right sternal edge. It is a systolic or an ejection systolic murmur, even better, which radiates to the carotids, does not have any associated thrills. The thing about the thrills, you can and cannot add, doesn't really matter. But, you know, if you find a murmur, quickly describe it. First of all, you know what it is. Um, and, you know, you don't have to remember later what you've heard. And, you know, it does help the examiner to say, oh, yes, they heard a murmur. Blah, blah, blah. Um, and remember, if you think you've heard a murmur, feel for the pulse. Um, some people say go for the carotid. I think any arterial pulse is fine because really what you're checking is whether the murmur is systolic or diastolic. And diastolic murmurs can be really hard um, to pick, to pick out even when you feel the pulse. So take a little bit of time to listen. And my tip would be don't bother naming the murmur. So if you're going, with, you know, you listen to the chest, don't go, oh, I hear aortic stenosis. Um, because in real life, patients do have mixed murmurs. Sometimes you think you've heard a thing and it's completely different <laughs> when the patient has had the echo. So just say what you hear. That's the safest, best way to like get your marks and look professional. I've heard, if you think it's pansystolic, say pansystolic in the you know mitral area, goes to the axilla, fantastic. You don't have to say it's mitral regurg. Maybe the patient has a million different valve disease uh, problems, you know, just say what you hear. Um, 
However, having said that, it is worth knowing what the main murmurs sound like. And some of them are really easy to find uh, you know, on the wards, especially things like aortic stenosis. Um, I think just examine patients, try and find one at least. Like they're pretty easy. Lots of people have them. Mitral rig edge is another decent one. Um, and if you can't, because of COVID, you've been shoved off the wards, there's loads of videos and audio resources where you can go listen. Unfortunately, I haven't got any on these presentation, um, but, you know, they're really easy to find and just familiarise yourself with what really they sound like um, and all the other things I've kind of mentioned. So just a really, really quick slide on murmurs. I don't want to spend ages talking about this, um, but... Um, you know, these are your typical ones that you, you know, you might want to know, especially for writtens and things like that, what they sound like. Aortic stenosis is your typical ejection systolic murmur, very harsh, does actually sound pretty harsh, and is often described, described as a crescendo, decrescendo murmur, um, as the blood sort of pumps out and then goes back down, tends to radiate to the carotids, not all the time. And often a louder murmur doesn't mean a worse degree of stenosis. It's often the other way around. If it's really narrow, then you're not going to hear as much of a murmur because there's less blood flow, really. Um, now, aortic regurgitation is best actually heard on the right side of the sternum, on the sorry, left side of the sternum. If it's on the right, they often say it's more associated with dissection. That might be true. I'm not a cardiologist. <laughs> Just a little tidbit of information there for you. It's an early diastolic murmur, which it's easier to hear if the patient is leaning forward and if they're breathing out. But again, it, is, it can be quite hard to hear because it's very quiet. You know, aortic stenosis is a really loud murmur. The other murmurs are more like, apart from mitral regurg, the other murmurs are a bit more rumbly, low volume. It, they are just harder to pick, um, to pick out. Um, in mitral stenosis, you might hear an opening snap. Um, and it tends to, you know, it's again one of the ones that it's easier to hear when the patient breathes out. Obviously, in the mitral area, it doesn't tend to radiate. And it's a sort of low, rumbling, mid diastolic murmur. Um, it's very quiet. Mitral stenosis is very, very, very hard to hear. Um, mitral regage, on the other hand, is the one that you might hear a bit more commonly, um, which is a pan systolic murmur. And it really does span the whole cardiac cycle. Um, so one to look out for your patients, you know, on the wards and it's a systolic murmur that really is a lot louder down there than up here on the chest. So it's a nice way to distinguish it from aortic stenosis. Um, all right. Now, just a really quick word on S1 and S2 and split sounds. My personal view on these is don't bother for OSCEs. I know some people talk about Tennessee, Kentucky, all these things. I mean... If someone really has an obvious gallop rhythm, you know, you hear your first heart sound, your second heart sound, and then there's something else, maybe then you can say, I think I hear a gallop rhythm. But to say whether it's S3, S4, and what the relevance of it is, I think it's quite tricky. And you don't want to say things that looks like you've made them up. <laughs> so I just wouldn't bother. Um, yes, there is all this thing about S1 and S2 splitting. You know, just a quick reminder, S1 is a closure of, you know, corresponds with the closure of your mitral and tricuspid valves and your S2, the closure of the semilunar valves, so your aortic and pulmonary. The splitting of the S2 can be quite common and physiological when people are breathing out, um, sorry, breathing in. But if it's fixed, in theory, it's, you know, not right. Is very very hard to hear. I mean, you'd have to spend a long time to figure out whether you can hear any splitting. Um, so I just I just wouldn't bother. That's my advice. If you want to go for it, go for it. Go all crazy. Fine. So you remember you've got your patient sitting forward. You've listened to the phases of the lungs, and opportunistically you can also stick a little hand at their sacrum and check for any edema. And um, it is a good time to do it in practice and in real life when the patient is leaning forward. Just get in there, have a little feel, and then the patient can lie back down and you can very smoothly move on to your peripheral examination while the patient is like lying back down. You have a quick look at their legs. Pretty quick look. Any obvious edema or peripheral venous changes, you know, um, do they have any hemosiderin deposits? I don't think you need to bother saying any of that. Have a feel for any edema. Pop your hand on the bony prominence on the leg. 
have a feel, see if there's any pitting. The proper way of doing it, of doing this is if you think there is any edema and any pitting, you should be moving up the legs to check where it ends. At least it is worth doing in real life when you've got patients because it tells you how overloaded they are. Obviously, if they don't have any sacral edema and you fell for it, then you know it doesn't go all the way up there, but it might go to the knee, might go to the thigh. All right. You might want to feel for peripheral pulses if you have time, but I wouldn't, you know, it's not an essential. So you're now concluding your examination. And like I was saying, you started well, you must end well. So cover and thank the patient, tell them you're finished. If they have any questions, wash your hands. Always wash your hands at the start and at the end. Remember, you will fail. <laughs> and at this point, you turn to the examiner. Now, I know some medical school want you to then give a full summary, check with whatever your one wants. Mine didn't, if you talk through the examination. And you turn to the examiner and you say your nice words to conclude the examination, I would like. And then you've got a nice list of things that you should have kind of ready for every system, you know, respiratory, abdominal, neurological, blah, blah, blah. So for the cardiovascular, it's nice having a structure again when you're saying this. So any extra examination, I would say at this point, you could say, I would like to do a full peripheral vascular examination and a respiratory examination. If you've heard anything in the chest, if they look cyanose, you know, it's always relevant to examine the respiratory and cardiovascular. And then say, I would also like, think about any bedside tests, an ECG, and then maybe a chest X-ray, if you think they've got something in the chest and an echo, if you've heard any murmur, it's really important that you say an echo because that's really going to tell you what the murmur was, not your auscultation, unless you're, you know, you're a cardiologist, so really, really good at murmurs. Um, yeah, so remember, have time, find time to have a little spiel at the end, conclude, thank the patient, wash, and tell the examiner what else you'd like to examine. And they might, at this point, some examiners are quite nice and they might tell you, is there anything else you'd like to do now if they think you've missed something? So this is a good time to be like, oh, I'm quickly going to look back at the eyes or at the JVP if you think you've forgotten it and things like that. You know, it's a good time to conclude and reflect what you've done. So we are now approaching the end. Couple more tips on smashing your OSCEs. So I've told you at the beginning, OSCEs are a well-rehearsed dance. And practice really does help in this context. Um, you know, practice at home on yourself, on your teddy, on your friends, on your partners, on whoever you want, you know, root everyone in. It's nice to have three colleagues, you know, one that starts, one that, you know, ends and you know, one takes notes, one is a patient, one is doing examination. And um, like I mentioned, be polite and kind, be systematic. And if you practice lots, you will be slick, which really matters when you have a limited amount of time. And, you know, you have to get everything in and look professional and look like, you know, what you're doing. Practice really helps. And then, like I've mentioned, know what you're talking about. You know, if you're looking for clinical signs, know what you're talking about, um, which is a key life skill. And I think it really shows, uh, you know, in examinations, if, you know, if anyone ever wants to ask a question at the end or the patient has any questions, that you can answer them. So I think we've got a little bit of time just to cover a couple of cases. Oh, I had more tips. Oh, oh yes. Um, there will be OSCE mask maskings around. There are some really good OSCE books. Um, and your medical school will probably have their own mask scheme, which they're happy to share. Um, that is a really nice one to practice on, you know, marking yourselves and making sure you know what's needed of you, what's asked. Um, and I mean, it's only understandable that you want to know exactly what you need to do. Um, and yeah. I think, you know, although OSCEs are a bit of a, you know, one of those tick boxing exercises, they will be useful in real life later on. It is worth knowing um, how to do these properly and what to look for in terms of sign. All right. So a couple of common cases in case you guys have things like vivas and, you know, questions at the end. I mean, my medical school in finals did OSLAS where you take a history exam on a patient and they'd ask you a bunch of questions. When it comes to the cardiovascular examination, there's a couple of things that they could ask you in the examination itself. I think a lot of um, 
a lot of these scenarios tend to be more cardiovascular related. So always think of things that might come up that your medical school likes. Mine really liked communication stations. So they often snuck in like and explain the patient, this and this. Um, you know, just pick out on these subtleties from your medical school. But um, just talk about like one probably you know, kind of common case is a patient that's come in because they have shortness of breath or perhaps they have chest pain on exertion and please examine the patient. So you'll do your full examination and what you'll find is an ejection systolic murmur and you think, ah, this fits in with aortic stenosis. So the examiners might ask you, what are your differentials? Um, with aortic stenosis, it's also worth including aortic sclerosis which is you know, a calcification of the valve rather than narrowing, um, which is only really, you can only really tell the difference in on an echo, not really in a cardiovascular examination, so it's worth mentioning. Um, and then you know, other valvular disease, another systolic murmur is mitral regurge, you could chuck it in there. Investigation that you might want to do, so bedside, you want to do an ECG, perhaps a urine dipstick to look for any end organ damage, um, bloods, so full blood count using these LFTs, not your usual, and then any imaging, chest x-ray and echo. You might want to do a coronary, coronary angiography. This patient is coming with chest pain. Makes sense. You know, you probably refer to cardiology and they'll have a look. So other things you might want to think about when it comes to aortic stenosis, things that you'll likely be asked if this comes up is what are the complications, right? So things like infective endocarditis, symbolic disease, very common, you know, left ventricular failure, heart failure, and then syncope, you know, if the patient drops down, they might hit the head, you know, things like that. Now, when it comes to the management, um, I haven't really done it here. In these questions, it's always worth going through your system, you know, systematic again. So things like management, think about conservative, medical, surgical. I've jumped straight into surgical management here just to, you know, didn't know how much time I would have had. Um, but, you know, for medical management, um, you know, conservative, obviously, if the patient doesn't want to do anything or you can give lifestyle advice and then medical management in terms of medication and surgical, it'll be a valve replacement. It is worth knowing when um, you might consider valve replacement, which for the aortic valve, which tends to be a TAVI, so you, they'll, they'll do, you know, a, they'll pass a valve through the catheter, it'll be minimally invasive surgery. It either be done for patients who are symptomatic with any degree of aortic stenosis or patients who have are maybe asymptomatic, but they also have impaired left ventricular ejection fraction or perhaps their aortic stenosis is very severe. So their aortic velocity is more than five millis a minute uh, per second. Um, or if they're undergoing cardiac surgery for any other reason, they'll, you have them there, you might as well fix their aortic valve at the same time. Now, another common case, things like patient has an irregular heart rhythm, examine them, and you find that they have an irregular, irregular heart rhythm. It's a pansystolic murmur that's louder in the axilla. You think, ah, mitral regurgitation. Now, the patient might also have signs of congestive heart failure, and that's because AF, Mitral regurgitation and heart failure often all go hand in hand. Um, so this is a really common patient scenario that you might see on the wards and in GP, you know. Again, think of your possible differentials if anyone asks. Um, and other viva questions, I'm not going to go too much into these, but, you know, if you've got things like a viva OSCE or, um, you know, cardiology OSCE with questions, there's loads of things that you can think about, you know, that will go in your written and they're relevant for clinical things like what are the benefits of a prosthetic versus a mechanical valve? Can you counsel a patient on this or maybe can you counsel a patient on anticoagulation? Um, you know, what are the risk factors and things like can you grade a murmur and you can give them the Levine grading, which I haven't put in here, but you can find that anywhere. All right. So. Yeah, these are other possible common things, you know, just think of things that they might ask you to explain to the patient or counsel, talk to them about. Um, these are all relevant, you know, possible things. So I think we have five minutes for questions, which I don't think there's loads of. So there should be plenty of time. Oh, 
that's not a question. <laughs> oh, here we go. Uh, PowerPoint be emailed. I don't think it does. I don't know how you guys get your PowerPoints. Oh, sorry, it's already answered. <laughs> All right, anything else in the chat? Fine, does anyone have any questions of the people who stuck till the end? Let me know. I think there's just one question in the chat that came in earlier. Uh, do you need to do the carotid auscult auscultation and radial pulse together? At the same time, um, no. No, you don't have to listen at the same time. Um, I mean, I'm kind of, I'm not sure what you, what the question, you know, is asking. Are you talking about like radio, radio delay or for breweries? Um, if you're looking for volume and character and rate, then you'll do your radio first and then you'll move on to brachial and carotid. Because the thing is, you're still feeling for a pulse. You're just feeling for slightly different qualities of a pulse. Um, I hope that kind of answers your question. So, no, so you don't want to have to like, Feel for radio and feel it higher up. You'll just pick one and then move on to the next. All right, fine. So I don't think we've got anything else. Great. Thanks so much, everyone. Yeah, no more questions, I think.